And it's time for Thevenin's Theorem. Thevenin's Theorem states that any single port linear bilateral network can be replaced with an appropriately sized voltage source in series with an appropriate impedance. Single port basically means there's two wires coming in to the rest of the circuit. The rest of the circuit will behave identically with the original versus the Thevenin. So this is a nice simplification technique that we can use on more complex circuits. We have to come up with a Thevenin voltage and a Thevenin impedance. The Thevenin voltage is simply found by determining the open circuit output voltage at the port. Similarly for Z Thevenin, the impedance, we find the impedance looking in to that port. This will work with, again, any linear bilateral network. So if something is linear, it's a straight line characteristic for current voltage. If it's bilateral, that means it behaves equally in either direction. First quadrant, third quadrant, like a resistor, you can't put a resistor in backwards. All right, so those are linear bilateral components, resistors, inductors, capacitors. This will also work with multiple sources. As a matter of fact, we can even think of source conversions as being sort of a special simplified case of Thevenin's theorem. There is a uh, sort of a parallel, no pun intended, with Thevenin's theorem called Norton's theorem, which says essentially the same thing except that we can produce a current source, a Norton current source, and a parallel Norton impedance as an equivalent instead of the voltage version, which is Thevenin. And clearly, if you can do one, you must be able to do the other just based on the idea of source conversions. So as an example, right, this is what we're talking about. We would say, let's say, here's a voltage source, and we have a little RLC network connected to it, something like this. couple of, you know, resistor capacitors and so forth. Now, out here is where I'm going to place our cut point, so to speak. All right, so this resistor out here is sort of the item of interest. Anyway, we have a source back here, E, and I'll just label these running through as, you know, R1, R2, and so forth. L, C, R2, R3. And then we have R4. Now, it's important to note that there is no such thing as a single Thevenin equivalent circuit for something like this. Where do we cut it, right? Every time we cut it, every time we come up with a port, two, two wires, two connections, there's a Thevenin equivalent. So that would be a trick question to say, what is the Thevenin equivalent of this circuit? Well, where do we want to cut it? Do I want to see what drives R3? Do I want to see what drives R4? Do I want to see what drives C? Or maybe the combination of C and R2? Or maybe I want to cut it like this. Right? What is it that drives this? Okay. So there's many possible things we might do. So this is a typical example, as we would sort of cut it right here. Right, think of these as your cut points. Now I want to find the equivalent circuit that drives R4. This would be very handy if we wanted to see what the results would be for different values of R4. Instead of having to uh, you know, reanalyze this entire circuit, we would just have this Thevenin equivalent that would drive R4, and it would be much, much simpler. Okay? So this is essentially what we're going to say is... Um, we wind up with this sort of a thing. Instead of the original E, we have this E Thevenin. And instead of this complicated network, I'll just draw a box here to indicate that there's a Z Thevenin. All right now, what's inside that box? Well, it's going to be a resistor in series with either an inductor or a capacitor, generally speaking. I mean, it might be purely resistive, it might be purely, a, purely reactive. But typically speaking, we would think of this as a complex impedance. 
So we would have, our, in this case, our force sitting out here. Right? If we were going to do the Norton equivalent, we would have the I Norton. And then there would be across it the Norton impedance. All right, so here's your Thevenin equivalent, here's your Norton equivalent. Now, just thinking about the source conversions we recently did, it's obvious you can go from here to here. As a matter of fact, Z Thevenin and Z Norton must be the same size. And we have the two, it's just sometimes convenient to have a voltage source, sometimes it's convenient to have a current source, so we can do it either way. Okay, so again, uh, just to remind you, the um, value of I Norton here would be determined from the short circuit current E Thevenin divided by Z Thevenin. And if you had this one going back the other way, right, we would find the open circuit output voltage. I Norton times Z Norton would give us the E Thevenin back here. So in any case, you know, let's take a take a look at this. Um, what are we what are we um, uh, going to wind up with? Okay, for this thing. Well, um, let's take a look at the at the um, the Z value first. So we basically look at this from the position of our four, where we've cut it. It's a common error to look in from you know, the source in this case, uh, but it's the, the uh, relative position of R4, where our cut point is. What is R4C? In other words, you're going to look back in this way. You know, like this. Okay, BR4. What do we see? So how do we simplify this? Well, whatever sources we have, in this case we just have one, but we could have multiple sources, we replace those sources with their ideal internal impedance. Um, for an ideal voltage source, that's going to be zero. For an ideal current source, that's going to be infinity. So we basically short the voltage sources, we open up the current sources, we see what we get. So when I do that for this circuit, when this shorts out, right, so we'll just say, all right, just sort of mentally short that thing out, what do we wind up with? Well, the R1 comes across like this. I'll just redraw this. L is effectively in parallel with it. Here is the C and R2. R3, and we're back to our cut points, right? This is where we were looking in. So you say, what is this impedance looking into here? Well, it's R3 in parallel with this whole thing. Well, what is that whole thing? That would be R2 and the X sub C in series, right? And then that combination would be in series with the parallel combination of R1 and X sub L. So we would put the appropriate values in there, of course, and uh, you know grind this out, and we'd come up with a certain value, and that is Z Thevenin. Now, what about the voltage? Right? What's E Thevenin? How do we find that? Well, we find the open circuit output voltage, so I'm going to repeat this original. But we'll just leave off the R4. And we ask, what is the, you know, what is the voltage that we see out here at these open terminals? All right, so there's R2, here's the capacitor inductor. R1, here's my source E. Well, there's many different ways we could solve this. Right? Um, one possibility would be to do some uh, like voltage divider effects. You know, if we called this, let's say, node A, and we called that node B, the voltage at node B, right, B to our reference point here, by definition, is the E Thevenin value. All right. Um, so we could just say, all right, um, if I knew what VA was, and we'll get to that in a sec, if 
I knew what VA was, I could just do a, a little voltage divider to find VB. All right, VB would have to be VA times the thing we're interested in, R3, over this combination, R3, R2, and minus Jx sub C. All right, just a basic voltage divider rule. All right, so how do I find VA? Well, we can do the same kind of thing a second time, all right? In other words, it's a divider between this combination of four components versus R1. Well, just to simplify this, let's call this whole thing, all right, let's call this collection of four things here. Oh, uh, ZX, how's that for an inventive name, all right? Again, we're looking at this now from the position of E, looking this way. So what do I see over here? Well, that's Jx sub L in parallel with this combination. Right? In other words, the R2 plus the R3 minus the Jx sub C. Right? That's what this is. That's in parallel with the X sub L. So the stuff in the blue box, that's Zx. So I can get VA as just being the source, E1 times the thing we're interested in, which is ZX, right, divided by the whole thing, which is R1 plus ZX. All right, so that's my VA voltage, which again, we divide down to get VB. VB is E Thevenin. So we should be able to take this value, put this over here, take this value, put this over here, and I can now take our four, put that out there, and the result that I get for this voltage or current will be identical with this circuit to this circuit. There will be no change. I can put any value of R4 in here that I want. It doesn't really matter what's out here. This doesn't work for just one resistor. This would work for a very complicated system. In other words, if we had something that was, let's say, more like this, you know, let's get a little nutty over here, right? Something like this. Because I've broken the circuit here, it doesn't really matter how complicated this thing is. It's the two points, right? There's my, there's my single port network, the two points that make up that port. So whether it's R4 or this more complicated thing that I'm drawing, right? the results in this will be the same as the results here. Right? So this whole thing here is just reduced down to this. And as I said, this is very handy in that we can now sort of play little what-if games uh, with the value of R4 or you know these other components, it will be much easier in the case of, let's say, R4 to just, for example, the load of uh, an amplifier, let's say. You can just sort of play with that very simply. Which would you rather analyze? You know, this thing or this thing? If you're going to sit there and monkey with values of R4. This is going to be much quicker. It'll be much, much more obvious to see what's happening. This will come in uh, very handy when we look at uh, you know, maximum power transfer. Um, interesting question is, hey, in this circuit, what value of R4 would produce the maximum amount of power? And this is exactly how we would uh, approach it. If I can simplify it down to here, um, this kind of computation turns out to be uh, very straightforward. All right, so there we have it.